In case you're wondering why our 285k review was late, that's because we weren't able to get them either word in time so that we could test our review sample. We did an unboxing video instead, and also I talked about the LGA 1851 socket and its future. Uh, there should be a link to watch that video on the screen right now, hopefully. But we did eventually get a motherboard, literally an hour after our unboxing video went up. ASRock kindly sent us their Z890 Lightning motherboard, a relatively mid-range Z890 motherboard that seems to punch above its weight. We'll have a review out on it eventually. Anyways, this video is all about the Core Ultra 9 to A5K, Intel's brand new flagship CPU. On paper, not much is different between the 285K and its predecessor, the Core i9 14900K. They both have 8 P cores and 16 E cores, and support PCIe 5.0 and DDR5 memory. However, Intel did make some notable changes. The L2 cache given to each P core has been increased from 2 megabytes to 3 megabytes, a 50% boost. Additionally, the 285K offers 20 PCIe 5.0 lanes rather than the 16 on the 14900K. That's technically only four more lanes, but if you have a four lane PCIe 5.0 SSD installed in your 1400K PC, the GPU can only use eight lanes. That leaves the final four lanes completely unused. The 285K finally allows for running a PCIe 5.0 SSD and GPU or another X16 device at full bandwidth. But perhaps the biggest change is the removal of hyperthreading. Now, hyperthreading only ever worked on P cores, so the 285K only lost 8 threads overall, but it's still a pretty big change. Intel used hyperthreading for about two decades because it boosted multi threaded performance, but now Intel believes it gains more than it loses by dropping the technology. There are, of course, architectural differences between 13th and 14th gen Raptor Lake and Air Lake that aren't visible on the spec sheet. These are just the broad strokes. If you want a deeper dive into the Arrow Lake architecture that powers the 285K and other Core Ultra 200 series CPUs, we have a video on that. But the short version is that this is sort of Intel's Zen 2 moment, where a lot of complex and cutting edge technology finally comes together. Now, the performance of the 285K is no secret at this point. The overwhelming story of the 285K is that it's slower than the 1400K, especially or specifically in games. That's despite all of the cool tech that goes into the 285K and other Aero Lake CPUs. Our data might show a slightly different story though, or at least I think so. Intel's new top end CPU is a bit of an oddity when it comes to games. And when you see the benchmarks, I think you'll agree. Anyways, say hello to the new LGA 1851 test bench. Compared to the LGA 1700 test bench we previously used, not much has changed. We're using the same 420mm Corsair liquid cooler, the same RTX 4090, and the same SSD. As I mentioned before, we have the Z890 Lightning from ASRock. It has an 18 plus 1 plus 1 stage VRM, which is a downgrade from the 24 plus 1 plus 2 stage design on the Z790 Tai Chi Lite, but the Lightning should be sufficient for the 285K at stock settings. We'll be using this test bench for SSD testing in the future as well. We also tweaked our RAM settings for Arrow Lake CPUs. Ryzen 9000 and 14th gen chips officially support 5600MHz RAM, which is what we clocked our G-Skill DDR5 kit at when we tested those CPUs. However, Arrow Lake processors officially support 6400MHz memory, so I wanted to test at that speed. Unfortunately, we couldn't get our hands on the 6400MHz kit, and the RAM we have on hand couldn't handle 6400MHz as it's a 5600 megahertz kit. So we ended up giving the Air Lake Systems RAM a frequency of 6000 megahertz and tightening the timings, which will hopefully simulate 6400 megahertz like performance. And for the record, our AMD test bench uses a B650EI RG Strix motherboard from ASUS, our 420mm Corsair cooler, and 5600MHz RAM. To be clear, this motherboard's 10 plus 2 stage VRM isn't beefy by any means, but performs just fine with pretty much any Ryzen CPU at stock settings thanks to active cooling. For comparison against the 285K, we tested the 1490K, AMD's Ryzen 9 9900X, and the Ryzen 7 7800X 3D. Application optimized was disabled for this review, and we used default TDPs for all chips, meaning the 285K and 1400K were set to their nominal 250 watt power limits. Anyways, let's take a look at the results. We're starting off with our non-gaming benchmarks, and first up is Cinebench 2024, the quintessential CPU rendering test. As we can see, the 285K shows a decent 14% improvement over the 1400K. It's also significantly ahead of the 9900X and the 7800X 3D, although these CPUs are cheaper and they don't have as many cores. The single-threaded numbers from Cinebench show that the 285K only makes small gains in single-threaded work, just 4% faster than the 1400K. 
The 285K's impressive multi-threaded performance is certainly not because the P-Cores are individually better than before, at least when it comes to rendering. It's a similar story in Geekbench 6, where the 285K has a 10% lead over the 1400K in the multi-threaded test. But the 285K pretty much ties the 1400K in the single-threaded test and actually loses to the 9900X, which was 7% faster. Finally, we have PC Mark 10, and since these scores also factor into the performance of the 4090, the margins here are more meaningful than they look. The 9900X took a clear lead, while the 285K and 1400K tied, and the 7800X 3D lagged behind. For our gaming benchmarks, first up is Total War 3 Kingdoms at 1080p, and the 7800X 3D takes a decent lead over the 1400K and the 285K. Here, we can see that the 285K can't quite match the 1400K, though it is at least head of the 9900X. When cranking up the settings, the CPU end up with largely similar performance, but the 1400K ends up on top thanks to its good 99th percentile frame rate. The 285K doesn't impress though. Counter-Strike 2 seems pretty favorable to Intel CPUs for whatever reason, so the 7800X 3D and the 9900X are behind the Intel flagships by a notable amount. However, the 285K is slightly behind the 1400K. The margins shrink at 1440p, but the performance order remains the same. In Civilization 6, the 285K finally takes the lead, and a pretty large one at that. The 99th percentile frame rate is also pretty good, which isn't always a given when the average frame rate is really high. At 1440p with more intense settings, the 285K remains in the lead, but the 1400K and 9900X did swap positions. In the turn timer test, the 285K slipped to second place with the 9900X in first. The 1400K was only slower by just under a second. City Skylines 2 mostly favors the 7800X 3D at 1080p in low graphics settings, while the other three chips performed roughly the same. Although the 285K had a lower average frame rate than the 1400K, its 99th percentile was a fair bit higher. If you just look at the average frame rate, all CPUs performed pretty much the same at 1440p with the very high preset, but there were significant differences in the 99th percentile Tile, which is how I organize these results. Here, the 285K ends up in the lead with a great 52 frames per second 99th percentile result, while the 7800X 3D ends up in last place. In Dota 2, the 7800X 3D just runs away with it, while the 9900X is in a distant second, ahead of the 285K and the 14900K. At least the 285K was the faster Intel CPU though. But at 1440p with the maximum graphic settings, the 285K slips to last place. In Dirt 5, the 7800X 3D stands out as the only CPU to break into the 400s, while all the other chips performed pretty much identically. When the graphics are amped up, all CPUs perform the same, and it seems we're mostly or entirely GPU bottlenecked. At least with all the graphics settings reduced as much as possible, it seems Minecraft doesn't particularly like AMD CPUs. The 285K and 1400K tied in the average frame rate, but the 285K is a bit behind in the 99th percentile. But when all the settings are maxed out, the 9900X takes the lead and the 285K falls into last place, though all the CPUs did perform roughly the same. In Metro Exodus Enhanced Edition, we can clearly see AMD CPUs are favored here at low settings, while the 285K and 1490K languish in a joint last place. But the tables are turned at 1440p with the 285K in the lead, albeit not by much since a GPU bottleneck seems to come into play with these settings. The Intel CPUs lead in Rainbow Six Siege, but the 1400K has a clear lead over the 285K. The average frame rates on all CPUs mostly converge with more intense settings, though we can clearly see that the 99th percentile frame rates are very different. The 7800X 3D has by far the best 99th percentile frame rate, while the 285K and 9900X tied in second, and the 1400K in last. Shadow of the Tomb Raider is a good game for the 7800X 3D and the 1400K at 1080p, with the lowest settings, while the 285K and the 9900X ended up in last. Not too much changes when the graphics settings are increased, but the 285K did manage to get a pretty good 99th percentile frame rate. Finally, we have The Witcher 3, which when using the low preset runs best on the 7800X 3D by quite a big margin. The other CPUs performed about the same, but the 285K was faster than the 1400K, particularly in the 99th percentile. After switching to the RT Ultra preset, the 285K soars into first, ahead of the 7800X 3D, and retains its good 99th percentile frame rate. The 285K shows a decently big improvement over the 1400K, which is now in last. We test The Witcher 3 in Novigrad, and the RT Ultra preset allows for a ton of NPCs, so perhaps the 285K is just really good at handling that sort of stuff. Okay, so in those raw horsepower benchmarks like Geekbench and Cinebench, the 285K is clearly faster than 1400K, especially in multi-threaded workloads and a little bit in single-threaded workloads too.
If you're doing content creation stuff like rendering videos, as we do here at Silicon Insights, the 2A5K is a modest upgrade over the 1400K. And although we didn't get around to benchmarking AI stuff, you can be sure that Air Lake is the best desktop CPU for AI workloads, thanks to its integrated neural processing unit. Okay, so gaming. It was weird, right? The 2A5K beat the 1400K a few times, the 1400K beat the 2A5K just as many times, and then they also tied the rest of the time. And for a new flagship CPU, that's really not what you expect. You'd normally expect the flagship to be significantly faster, or at least beat the old one most of the time. I think this strange performance profile is down to what the 285K is made of. Intel gave up some things when compared to the 1400K, about 300 megahertz in clock speed and hyperthreading. But Intel also boosted the L2 cache given to peak cores by 50%, and they also improved the core architecture in general. So in games that benefit more from higher frequencies, we saw a performance regression, while in games that care more about cache, we saw a performance boost. With an MSRP of $630, the 2A5K is about $200 more expensive than the 1400K. It's also about $200 more expensive than the Ryzen 7 7800X 3D, which it lost to most of the time. Plus, Ryzen 9000 X3D is coming out next month, and I'm sure that the 9800 X3D will also make the 2A5K look too expensive. That's not to say the 2A5K sucks at gaming. It achieves an excellent frame rate in every game we tested. It's just that it's not as good as cheaper CPUs that were already on the market. If you're buying a Core Ultra 200 chip, you're also buying into the LGA 1851 platform. And although it's pretty modern, has lots of PCIe 5.0 lanes, I'm unsure what Intel's going to do with it after the Core Ultra 200 series. I talked about this in our unboxing video, but here's the brief version. For over a decade, Intel has only supported up to two architectures on a single socket. The thing is, LGA1851 supports both Meteor Lake and Aero Lake, so it's already at two. The big question is whether Intel will stick to its long-standing approach to socket support, or if it will give LGA1851 a third architecture, something that it hasn't done since the original Core CPUs came out almost two decades ago. I'm hoping Intel won't abandon LGA1851, but we can't be sure until Intel says something, and that really gives me pause because who in their right mind would buy a motherboard that only works for one specific series of CPUs? To me, that makes the 1400K a pretty valid alternative. Sure, LGA1700 won't receive new CPUs, but LGA1851 might not either. And considering the 1400K is just as fast as the 285K, what's the difference? Then there's AMD's AM5 socket, which will almost certainly receive one more generation, if not two. Considering the 285K's gaming performance and the uncertain future of the LGA1851 socket, I'm not going to recommend the 285K. The 1400K is just a cheaper version of the 285K, and AMD has lots to offer too. And that's a shame, because the technology that Arrow Lake is built on is really cool, but it just didn't really shake things up at the top of the stack. Perhaps this is more like Intel's Zen 1 moment, but I feel like Intel has already had that once with Alder Lake and then again with Meteor Lake. That being said, we didn't cover a lot of things in this review that we will in future videos, namely Intel's new application optimization update and power efficiency on the 2A5K. We'll have videos out for those soon, so stay tuned. We're also working on our Core Ultra 5 245K review, which should be out next week, so don't miss it. Anyways, that's our take on the Core Ultra 9 2A 5K. If you liked our testing and analysis, please like the video, leave a comment, subscribe, and click the bell icon to get notified when we upload new videos. If you want to support us financially, we have a Patreon that you can donate to, a link is in the description. As always, thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.